chapter one part one of the life of washington volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of washington volume four by john marshall chapter one part one green invests camden battle of hopkirk's hill progress of marion and lee lord rawdon retires into the lower country green invests ninety six is repulsed retires from that place active movements of the two armies after a short repose they resume active operations battle of utah the british army retires towards charleston seventeen eighty one in south carolina and georgia the campaign of seventeen eighty one was uncommonly active the importance of the object the perseverance with which it was pursued the talents of the generals the courage activity and sufferings of the armies and the accumulated miseries of the inhabitants gave to the contest for these states a degree of interest seldom bestowed on military transactions in which greater numbers have not been employed when lord cornwallis entered north carolina the military operations in the more southern states were committed to lord rawdon for the preservation of his power a line of posts slightly fortified had been continued from charleston by the way of camden and ninety six to augusta in georgia the spirit of resistance was still kept up in the northwestern and northeastern parts of the state by generals sumter and marion who respectively commanded a corps of militia their exertions though great seem not to have been successful and they excited no alarm because no addition to their strength was apprehended such was the situation of the country when general green formed the bold resolution of endeavoring to re-annex it to the american union his army consisted of about eighteen hundred men the prospect of procuring subsistence was unpromising and the chance of reinforcements precarious he was apprised of the dangers to be encountered but believed it to be for the public interest to meet them i shall take every measure said this gallant officer in a letter communicating his plan of operations to general washington to avoid a misfortune but necessity obliges me to commit myself to chance and if any accident should attend me i trust my friends will do justice to my reputation the extensive line of posts maintained by lord rawdon presented to green many objects at which it was probable he might strike with advantage the day preceding his march from the camp on deep river he detached lee to join general marion and communicated his intention of entering south carolina to general pickens with a request that he would assemble the western militia and lay siege to ninety six and augusta april green invests camden having made these arrangements he moved from deep river on the seventh of april and encamped before camden on the nineteenth of the same month within half a mile of the british works lord rawdon had received early notice of his approach and was prepared for his reception april twenty four camden stands on a gentle elevation and is covered on the south and southwest by the watery and on the east by pine tree creek a strong chain of redoubts extending from the river to the creek protected the north and west sides of the town being unable to storm the works or to invest them on all sides green contented himself with lying before the place in the hope of being reinforced by militia or of some event which might bring on an action in the open field with this view he retired a small distance and encamped on hobkirk's hill about a mile and a half from the town while in this situation he received information that colonel watson was marching up the santee with about four hundred men a junction between these two divisions of the british army could be prevented only by intercepting watson while at a distance from camden for this purpose he crossed sandhill creek and encamped east of camden on the road leading to charleston it being impracticable to transport the artillery and baggage over the deep marshes adjoining the creek colonel carrington with the north carolina militia 
was directed to convey them to a place of safety and to guard them till farther orders the army continued a few days in its new encampment during which the troops subsisted on the scanty supplies furnished by the neighbourhood green was compelled at length by the want of provisions to relinquish this position about the same time he received intelligence which induced him to doubt the approach of watson on which he ordered lieutenant colonel carrington to rejoin him and on the twenty fourth returned to the north side of the town and again encamped on hobkirk's hill a ridge covered with uninterrupted wood through which the great waxhaw road passes the army was encamped in order of battle its left covered by the swamp of pine tree creek april twenty five a drummer who deserted on the morning after green's return and before he was rejoined by lieutenant colonel carrington gave information to lord rawdon that the artillery and militia had been detached his lordship determined to seize this favourable occasion for fighting his enemy to advantage and at the head of nine hundred men marched out of town on the morning of the twenty fifth to attack the american army lieutenant colonel carrington had arrived in camp that morning and brought with him a supply of provisions which had been issued to the troops some of whom were employed in cooking and others in washing their clothes notwithstanding those occupations they were in reach of their arms and were in readiness to take their ground and engage at a moment's warning battle of hobkirk's hill by keeping close to the swamp and making a circuit of some distance lord rawdon gained the american left without being perceived and about eleven his approach was announced by the fire of the advanced piquets who were half a mile in front of green's encampment orders were instantly given to form the american line of battle the virginia brigade commanded by general huger consisting of two regiments under campbell and hawes was drawn up on the right of the great road the maryland brigade commanded by colonel williams consisting also of two regiments under gunby and ford was on the left and the artillery was placed in the centre the north carolina militia under colonel reed formed a second line and captain kirkwood with the light infantry was placed in front for the purpose of supporting the piquets and retarding the advance of the enemy general green remained on the right with campbell's regiment captain morgan of virginia and captain benson of maryland who commanded the piquets gave the enemy a warm reception but were soon compelled to retire captain kirkwood also was driven in and the british troops appeared in view rawdon continued his march through the wood along the low ground in front of the maryland brigade which was in the act of forming until he reached the road where he displayed his column perceiving that the british advanced with a narrow front green ordered colonel ford whose regiment was on the extreme left the, and lieutenant colonel campbell whose regiment was on the extreme right severally to attack their flanks while gunby and hawes should advance upon their front with charged bayonets to complete their destruction by cutting off their retreat to the town lieutenant colonel washington was ordered to pass their left flank and charge them in the rear the regiments commanded by ford and campbell being composed chiefly of new levies did not change their ground and perform the evolutions necessary for the duty assigned to them with the requisite rapidity and precision in consequence of which rawdon who instantly perceived the danger that threatened his flanks had time to extend his front by bringing the volunteers of ireland into his line this judicious movement disconcerted the design on his flanks and brought the two armies into action fronting each other but the regiments of ford and campbell were thrown into some confusion by the abortive attempt to gain the flanks of the british colonel washington too was compelled by the thick underwood and felled trees which obstructed his direct course to make so extensive a circuit that he came into the rear of the british at a greater distance from the scene of action than was intended in consequence of which he fell in with their medical and other staff and with a number of the followers of the army and idle spectators who took no part in the action too humane to cut his way through this crowd he employed so much time in taking their verbal parole that he could not reach the rear of the british line until the battle was ended these casualties disappointed this very interesting part of green's intended operations the artillery however played on the enemy with considerable effect and the regiments of gunby and hawes advanced on the british front with resolution some companies on the right of the maryland regiment returned the fire of the enemy and their example was followed by the others notwithstanding this departure from orders 
they continued to advance with intrepidity and green entertained sanguine hopes of victory his prospects were blasted by one of those incidents against which military prudence can make no provision captain beatty who commanded on the right of gunby's regiment was killed upon which his company without adjoining it got into confusion and dropped out of the line gumby ordered the other companies which were still advancing to fall back and form with the two companies behind the hill which the british were ascending this retrograde movement was mistaken for a retreat and the regiment gave way encouraged by this circumstance the british pressed forward with increased ardor and all the efforts of colonel williams and of gumby and howard to rally the regiment were for a time ineffectual this veteran regiment distinguished alike for its discipline and courage which with the cavalry of washington who had won the battle of the cowpens and nearly won that at guilford courthouse was seized with an unaccountable panic which for a time resisted all the efforts of their officers the flight of the first maryland regiment increased the confusion which the change of ground had produced in the second and in attempting to restore order colonel ford was mortally wounded lord rawdon improved these advantages to the utmost his right gained the summit of the hill forced the artillery to retire and turned the flank of the second virginia regiment commanded by lieutenant colonel hawes which had advanced some distance down the hill by this time the first virginia regiment which green had endeavored to lead in person against the left flank of the british being also in some disorder began to give ground perceiving this reverse in his affairs and knowing that he could not rely on his second line green thought it most advisable to secure himself from the hazard of a total defeat by withdrawing the second virginia regiment from the action the maryland brigade was in part rallied but lord rawdon had gained the hill and it was thought too late to retrieve the fortune of the day green determined to reserve his troops for a more auspicious moment and ordered a retreat finding that the infantry had retreated colonel washington also retired with the loss of only three men bringing with him about fifty prisoners among whom were all the surgeons belonging to the british army the americans retreated in good order about four miles from the field of battle and proceeded next day to rugeley's mills the pursuit was continued about three miles in the course of it some sharp skirmishing took place which was terminated by a vigorous charge made by colonel washington on a corps of british horse who led their van this corps being broken and closely pursued the infantry in its rear retreated precipitately into camden april twenty sixth the number of continental troops engaged in this action amounted to about twelve hundred men and the loss in killed wounded and missing to two hundred and sixty six among the killed was captain beatty of maryland who was mentioned by general green as an ornament to his profession and among the wounded was colonel ford of maryland a gallant officer whose wounds proved mortal the militia attached to the army amounted to two hundred and sixty six of whom two were missing the total loss sustained by the british army has been stated at two hundred and fifty eight of whom thirty eight were killed in the field the plan which the strength of camden and his own weakness had induced general green originally to adopt was still substantially pursued he remained in the vicinity of that place and by the activity of his cavalry straightened the communication of the garrison with the neighboring country their distress for provisions had been considerably increased by the progress of marion and lee several british posts taken lieutenant colonel lee joined marion a few days after he was detached from the camp on deep river and these two officers commenced their operations against the line of communication between camden and charleston by laying siege to fort watson which capitulated in a few days the acquisition of this fort afforded the means of interrupting the intercourse between camden and charleston and deposed an obstacle to the retreat of lord rawdon which he would have found it difficult to surmount from the increasing perils of his situation his lordship was relieved by the arrival of colonel watson in attempting to obey the orders which were given by lord rawdon on the approach of green to join him at camden that officer found himself opposed by marion and lee who had seized the passes over the creeks in his route and had thus completely arrested his march to elude these vigilant adversaries watson returned down the santee and crossing that river near its mouth marched up its southern side and recrossing it above the american detachment and eluding all the measures taken to intercept him accomplished his object with much toil and hazard 
this reinforcement gave the british general a decided superiority and green entertained no doubt of its being immediately employed on the day of its arrival therefore he withdrew from the neighbourhood of camden and took a strong position behind sawney's creek may seven on the night of the seventh as had been conjectured rawdon passed the watery at camden ferry intending to turn the flank of his enemy and to attack his rear where the ground was less difficult than in front on being informed that the american army had changed its position he followed it to its new encampment this was so judiciously chosen that he despaired of being able to force it and after some ineffectual manoeuvres to draw green from it returned to camden eighth lord rawdon had been induced to relinquish thus hastily his designs upon green by the insecurity of his situation the state of the british power in south carolina was such as to require a temporary surrender of the upper country marion and lee after completely destroying his line of communication on the north side of the santee had crossed that river and permitted no convoy from charleston to escape their vigilance on the eighth of may after watson had passed them they laid siege to a post at mott's house on the south side of the congaree near its junction with the watery which had been made the depot of all the supplies designed for camden from the energy of this party as well as from the defection of the inhabitants lord rawdon had reason to apprehend the loss of all his lower posts unless he should take a position which would support them he had therefore determined to evacuate camden unless the issue of a battle with green should be such as to remove all fears of future danger from that officer lord rawdon retires into the lower country may twelve having failed in his hope of bringing on a general engagement he evacuated camden and marched down the river on its north side to nielsen's ferry among the objects to be obtained by this movement was the security of the garrison at mott's house but the siege of that place had been so vigorously prosecuted that on crossing the river his lordship received the unwelcome intelligence that it had surrendered on the twelfth and that its garrison consisting of one hundred and sixty-five men had become prisoners on the preceding day the post at orangeburg had surrendered to sumter on the evening of the fourteenth lord rawdon moved from nielsen's ferry and marched to monk's corner a position which enabled him to cover those districts from which charleston drew its supplies may while the british army was thus under the necessity of retiring the american force was exerted with a degree of activity which could not be surpassed after the post at mott's house had fallen marion proceeded against georgetown on the black river which place he reduced and lee marched against fort granby a post on the south of the congaree which was garrisoned by three hundred and fifty-two men principally militia the place was invested on the evening of the fourteenth and the garrison capitulated the next morning the late movement of the british army had left the garrison of ninety six and of augusta exposed to the whole force of green and he determined to direct his operations against them lee was ordered to proceed against the latter while the general should march in person to the former the post at ninety six was fortified the principal work which from its form was called the star and which was on the right of the village consisted of sixteen salient and re-entering angles and was surrounded by a dry ditch phrase and abatis on the left was a valley through which ran a rivulet that supplied the place with water this valley was commanded on one side by the town prison which had been converted into a blockhouse and on the other by a stockade fort in which a blockhouse had been erected the garrison commanded by lieutenant colonel kruger was ample for the extent of the place but was furnished with only three pieces of artillery on evacuating camden lord rawdon had given directions that the garrison of ninety six should retire to augusta but his messengers were intercepted and kruger remaining without orders determined to put his post in the best possible state of defence green invests ninety six on the twenty second of may the american army consisting of about one thousand continental troops appeared before the town and encamped in a wood within cannon shot of the place on the following night they broke ground within seventy yards of the british works but the besieged having mounted several guns in the star
made a vigorous sally under their protection and drove the advance party of the besiegers from their trenches put several of them to the bayonet and brought off their entrenching tools this sortie was made with such rapidity that though general green put his whole army in motion the party making it had accomplished the object and retired into the fort before he could support his troops in the trenches after this check the siege was conducted with more caution but with indefatigable industry on the eighth of june lee rejoined the army with the troops under his command the day after the fall of fort granby that active officer proceeded with great celerity to join general pickens and lay siege to augusta on the march he took possession of fort golfin on the northern bank of the savannah which surrendered on the twenty first of may immediately after which the operations against augusta were commenced the place was bravely defended by lieutenant colonel brown but the approaches of the besiegers were so well conducted that on the fifth of june he was reduced to the necessity of capitulating and the prisoners amounting to about three hundred were conducted by lee to the main army this reinforcement enabled general green who had till then made his approaches solely against the star to commence operations against the works on the left also the direction of the advances to be made in that quarter was entrusted to lieutenant colonel lee while the besiegers urged their approaches in the confidence that the place must soon capitulate lord rawdon received a reinforcement which enabled him once more to overrun the state of south carolina june seven on the third of june three regiments arrived from ireland and on the seventh of that month lord rawdon marched at the head of two thousand men to the relief of ninety six green received intelligence of his approach on the eleventh and ordered sumter to whose aid the cavalry was detached to continue in his front and to impede his march by turning to the best account every advantage afforded by the face of the country but lord rawdon passed sumter below the junction of the saluda and broad rivers after which that officer was probably unable to regain his front green had also intended to meet the british and fight them at some distance from ninety six but found it impossible to draw together such aids of militia as would enable him to execute that intention with any prospect of success the only remaining hope was to press the siege so vigorously as to compel a surrender before lord rawdon could arrive june seventeen in the execution of this plan the garrison was reduced to extremities when the near approach of his lordship was communicated to kruger by a loyalist who passed through the american lines and extinguished every hope of carrying the place otherwise than by storm unwilling to relinquish a price he was on the point of obtaining green resolved to essay everything which could promise success but the works were so strong that it would be madness to assault them unless a partial attempt to make a lodgment on one of the curtains of the star redoubt and at the same time to carry the fort on the left should the first succeed june eighteen is repulsed and retires from before that place the proper dispositions for this partial assault being made lieutenant colonel lee at the head of the legion infantry and kirkwood's company was ordered to assault the works on the left of the town while lieutenant colonel campbell was to lead the first regiment of maryland and the first of virginia against the star redoubt the lines of the third parallel were manned and all the artillery opened on the besieged about noon the detachments on this service marched cheerfully to the assault lee's attack on the left was successful he forced the works in that quarter and took possession of them but the resistance on the right was more determined and campbell though equally brave was less fortunate lieutenants duval of maryland and selden of virginia led the forlorn hope and entered the ditch with great intrepidity but its depth and the height of the parapet opposed obstructions which could not be surmounted after a severe conflict of more than half an hour during which lieutenants duval and selden were both badly wounded and nearly all the forlorn hope were either killed or wounded the assault was relinquished and the few who remained alive were recalled from the ditch the next day green raised the siege and crossing the saluda encamped on little river the loss of the besieging army in killed and wounded amounted to one hundred and fifty five men among the former of whom was captain armstrong of maryland that of the garrison has been stated at eighty five 
on the morning of the twenty first of june lord rawdon arrived at ninety six and on the evening of the same day marched in quest of the american army in the preceding operations of the campaign he had felt the want of cavalry so severely that while at monk's corner and in charleston he had formed a corps of one hundred and fifty horse active movements of the two armies green foreseeing that his active adversary would avail himself to the utmost of his superiority had sent his sick and wounded northward and as soon as rawdon had crossed the saluda he retreated towards virginia lord rawdon pursued him to the eunora whence he returned to ninety six the retreat ceased with the pursuit general green halted near the cross-roads on the north of broad river as rawdon retired he was followed close by the legion as far as ninety six at which place he remained but two days still retaining the opinion that circumstances required him to contract his posts he left the principal part of his army under the command of lieutenant colonel kruger to protect the loyalists while removing within those limits which were to be maintained by the british forces and at the head of less than one thousand men marched in person towards the congaree supposing that his adversary intended to preserve the post at ninety six where the royalists were numerous and to establish one or two on the congaree where provisions were more plentiful than any other part of the state green determined to interrupt the execution of the plan which he believed to have been formed leaving his sick and baggage at winsborough to be conducted to camden he marched with the utmost expedition for friday's ferry on the congaree at which place lord rawdon had arrived two days before him as green drew near to his enemy a detachment from the legion under the command of captain eggleston announced his approach by attacking a foraging party within a mile of the british camp and bringing off a troop consisting of forty-five men with their officers and horses rawdon retreated the next day to orangeburg where he formed a junction with a detachment from charleston commanded by lieutenant colonel stewart july eleventh on the congaree green was reinforced by sumter and marion with about one thousand men and on the eleventh of july marched towards orangeburg with the intention of attacking the british army at that place he arrived there the next day and found it so strongly posted as to be unassailable he offered battle but prudence restrained him from attacking the enemy in his camp july thirteenth at this place intelligence was received of the evacuation of ninety six and that lieutenant colonel kruger was marching down to orangeburg the north branch of the edisto which for thirty miles was passable only at the place occupied by rawdon interposed an insuperable obstacle to any attempt on kruger and green thought it most advisable to force the british out of the upper country by threatening their lower posts at monk's corner and at dorchester sumter marion and lee were detached on this service and on the same day green moved towards the high hills of santee a healthy situation where he proposed to give some refreshment and repose to his harassed army and where he hoped to be joined by a few continental troops and militia from north carolina the detachments ordered against the posts in the northeastern parts of the state under the command of sumter were not so completely successful as their numbers courage and enterprise deserved the several corps took distinct routes intending to fall on the different posts between ashley and cooper rivers at the same time that at dorchester was broken up on the approach of lee who captured horses military stores and baggage to a considerable amount and obtained some trivial successes over the flying enemy lieutenant colonel wade hampton of the state cavalry fell in with a body of mounted refugees dispersed the whole and made forty or fifty prisoners sumter advanced against monk's corner this post was defended by lieutenant colonel coates with the nineteenth british regiment and a troop of horse he had taken possession of a brick church at a bridge over biggin creek the most northern of the watercourses which formed the west branch of cooper river after passing biggin the road to charleston crosses first watteau and then quinby creek neither of which is passable except at the bridges over which the road leads and at a ferry over quinby End of chapter one part one